Father, tonight we thank you that we can stand here and proclaim that we are redeemed. Because you have loved us, because you have looked past our sin and called us worthy, because you have decided to, to rescue us through Jesus, we can proclaim that we are forgiven, that we have life, and that we can live as sons and daughters of the living God. So tonight, Father, thank you. We simply ask that you would speak into our lives, that we could hear your voice, and we would be changed. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I'm going to invite you to have a seat while I get to introduce someone to you. You know, Calvary exists to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. And uh, that purpose statement informs every decision that we make. It, it uh, nope, you're, you're way ahead. We don't need anything up there yet. I see that. Yes, blank would be good. We'll be there in a minute. Uh, not for that one, but... Uh, Anyway, th that purpose of leading people to life-changing relationship with Jesus informs every decision that we make. It, it informs uh, how we uh, spend our money, who to hire, the ministries we engage in, and how we invest the resources that God gives us. Uh, for example, uh, Calvary gives 21% of its undesignated receipts to missions. Uh, now, whether you realize that or not, uh, that means that every time you drop a dollar in one of the offering boxes, that we give 21 cents of that away to ministries that are involved in leading people to life change outside the walls of Calvary. Uh, this year, the last 12 months, we invested $362,000 in missions. Yeah, isn't that cool? And, uh, and that was including things like, uh, you know, locally, benevolence. We, we gave away $30,000 of benevolence this past year to help people pay their light bills, to, to feed them when they're hungry, uh, help them pay the rent, fix their cars, all different kinds of things because of your generosity. Uh, we partner with pregnancy care. We partner with interagency, with all kinds of, of groups here in town to, to make this a better place to live. Uh, we invested in regional missions uh, like Peach Springs and San Luis. Uh, you guys know for six years we've been we've been going up to, to Peach Springs on the Wallapai Nation, and there we've been working uh, to to connect with the community in hopes that we could plant a church someday. And for six years we've been doing this at least four times a year. And I'm I'm happy to tell you that in 2015 we are co-sponsoring a church plant in Peach Springs on the Wallapai Nation. Isn't that cool? And then, of course, we invest in things like uh, our, our ministries and trips to Thailand, where we did medical missions to Albania, where we're uh, trying to work with uh, just a small group of Christians in that town that, uh, where uh, 40,000, where less than 200 people call on Jesus as Savior. Uh, we work uh, with Greece with the Helping Hands Ministry. We send a team to Idaho to help strengthen churches. Uh, we do those things, but I want you to know that the largest investment that we make as a church is in the cooperative program of the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, we give 10% to the cooperative program, which last year totaled $123,000. And, and uh, you might be going, what is, what is that? What is the cooperative program of the Southern Baptist Convention? Uh, it's where we partner with about 40,000 other churches to support 5,000 international missionaries, like the ones we worked with in Thailand, uh, to support... 5,000 missionaries in North America that help plant churches and do ministry all over our nation, and to support six seminaries that train pastors and missionaries. And so we're investing in that. And I think one of the reasons that God is blessing Calvary is because of our commitment to be involved in his mission of life change from Lake Havasu City to the ends of the earth. And, uh, and tonight, as we discuss missions, I've invited my friend, uh, Dr. David Johnson, to, to come and share. Now, you don't know David from anybody else, uh, but uh, you might have figured out he's the guy sitting on the front row next to me just a, a little bit ago. But uh, let me tell you just a, a little bit about him. Uh, he's pastored churches in Arizona and even in Texas. You know, hey, they need Jesus in Texas too. Uh, 
But he did that for over 20 years. Uh, he served as the uh, director of the Arizona campus of Golden Gate Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, that's the seminary where I got my doctorate from. And, and uh, right now, he is currently the executive director of the Arizona Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, none of those are the reasons that he's here tonight. I'm just telling you that. that, that's not, that, that all that stuff is just telling you what he's done. But the reason he's here tonight is because he's passionate about the mission of Christ. And I've seen that in his heart, and, and I've seen that in his life. Uh, David is committed to making disciples of all peoples in Arizona and around the world. And he's going to come and share with us uh, right after you watch this video by David Platt, who is the president of the International Mission Board. I see a nation like India, where there are more people living below the poverty line than there are people in the United States altogether. Last week alone, 100,000 children died of hunger-related diseases. I see a world where our dogs and our cats are eating better than our brothers and sisters in the Sudan. In addition to over a billion people who haven't even heard the name of Jesus that's on our lips. And on top of all of that, thousands upon thousands of our brothers and sisters who are imprisoned and persecuted in China and Laos, North Korea and Saudi Arabia. And when we should be on the firing lines for God, when our people should be on the firing lines for God, most of them are still in the nurseries of our churches drinking spiritual milk with the mammoth needs of a world without Christ in front of us. We face two options. We can retreat from this mission into a land of religious formalism and wasted opportunity or we can risk everything to fulfill the divine purpose for which we have been created. And I say, let's risk it all. I say, let's risk it all. For the sake of a billion people who haven't heard his name, I say, let's risk it all. We are not living for this city anymore. We are living for the city that is to come. Are we going to die in our religion or die in our devotion? God help us to do the latter. Why risk it all? Why do what you're doing? Why send thousands of dollars away from this church? Why give tens of thousands of dollars away while you're trying to raise money for a building, while you have ministries to support and things to do? Why give all of that money? Why go to Wallapai Nation? Why go to Peach Springs? Why go to San Luis? Why go to Albania? Why go anywhere? The costs are immense. Why support 5,000 missionaries in a day when people wonder if we should even be sending missionaries? They question if we're doing the right thing at all. Why risk it all? Why give so much? There has to be some reason. And it better be a good one. It better be more than just we want to be nice or we want to help people. All of those are good things, but you can do that by giving to the United Way. Why? The answer goes back to the very heart of God. The story that God has been writing from the very beginning. The story that you and I are now caught up in. It is the theme that runs from Genesis all the way to Revelation. It is the mission of God. If you have a Bible with you, I would invite you to open up to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. I know your sermon notes say Genesis 8 and 9. I'm going to read verses 8 and 9 of Genesis 3. 
Because this is a story that you are very familiar with. And if you're not familiar with it, you will be. Because the truth is, every person in this room has lived this story. You've experienced it personally. Because it's the story of Adam and Eve. The story of the garden. The story of how God created them and placed them in that perfect place where they had fellowship with him and unbroken relationship with each other. A beautiful place. A place where they were given leeway to be able to eat of any tree that they chose from with the exception of one. Just that one. And you know the serpent presented that temptation to them and they wanted to be like God knowing both good and evil. And they partook of that fruit and immediately in the very act of that they experienced something they had never experienced before. Shame and guilt, and remorse, and distance, brokenness from their very creator. And so, we pick up this story. God comes into the garden, and this is what we find. Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. The Lord God called to the man, Where are you? Where are you? It occurs to me that that's an odd question. Did God know where they were? Of course he did. He's God. Did God know what they had done? Of course he did. He's God. So why ask the question? Why say the words out loud? Where are you? It was not for his benefit. It was for theirs. God wanted them to know that he cared about them. That he loved them. That he wanted to restore relationship with them. He came looking for them. He was searching for lost humanity. And that story is the story that God has been writing ever since that day. From the Garden of Eden to the Garden of Gethsemane, this book is the story of God searching for lost humanity. Saying, where are you? Because he cares Because he wants to forgive, he wants to restore, he wants to redeem. He wants to bring us back to him. That's the mission of God. Searching for lost humanity. Your pastor told me that recently they went on this mission trip to Thailand. Took a group of people from here and and they went to work with one of the missionaries that you help support through that cooperative program that your pastor was talking about. One of those 5,000 missionaries, Doug and Cheryl Derbyshire, living in a remote country of Thailand, in a place where they have little or no medical care. Dr. Doug Derbyshire is a graduate of the University of Arizona Medical Center. He could get a job practicing medicine anywhere in any hospital in this country. He is a fine doctor. Do you know what he does? He has poured out his life treating people in remote villages who have little or no medical care, would never have access to it if he weren't traveling to go and dispense medication and do examinations. He'll see sometimes 200 people in a day. And do you know every one of those 200 people hear the gospel? Because he tells them about God's love for them. He tells them about a God who is searching for them. He doesn't just practice medicine. He doesn't just show kindness. He speaks the gospel. That's where your pastor was. Working with those people. Going where they were when those medical clinics. Helping them to learn English. Teaching. But sharing the gospel. You know what that is? That is God. Searching for lost humanity. That is God walking through the garden saying, where are you? Where are you? That's why you go to Albania. That's why you go to Peach Springs. That's why you go to San Luis. That's why you go to all of these places. 
That's the mission of God. And God invites us to join him in that mission. As you go through this story, you begin to realize that this is what was behind it when God called Abraham. And God said to Abraham, I'm going to give you a great land. I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to give you a great name. And then he said, I'm going to do all of this so that all the families, all the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Because God was calling Abraham to join him in this mission. And God began to work that out in the lives of his people as he he called Moses. As he revealed himself to the people of Israel. As he showed them the one true and living God who had a purpose. Who had a, a mission for all the nations and all the peoples of the earth. But over and over and over again they failed in that mission. They failed to live out that purpose even through the prophets as they spoke to them. But God promised one man, one man from Israel who would fulfill all the purpose that God had for Israel and beyond that, that make it possible for all nations to see him, the light for the Gentiles. His name was Jesus Christ. Jesus came to fulfill that mission of God. And when Jesus began to teach and describe why he was here, well, let's look at this. In Luke Chapter 19. If you have your Bibles, just flip over a few pages to Luke chapter 19. Or find it on your tablet. This is another story that you remember quite well. It's a story that's very familiar. The story that we teach preschoolers. You remember the story? Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He wasn't just a wee little man. He was a wicked little man. He was a wicked little man. He was a tax collector. He had betrayed his own people. There was a reason why tax collectors were hated. They weren't just traitors. Most of them were thieves. They would take whatever they wanted in the name of the government that was oppressing the very people that they lived among. That was Zacchaeus. But there was something about Jesus... Something about Jesus that captivated Zacchaeus, that that drew him. And so when Jesus was passing through that town of Jericho, Zacchaeus, because he was a wee little man, climbed up in that tree. And here comes Jesus. Luke chapter 19. I'll pick up the story in verse 5. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus... Come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be a guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anyone out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. Zacchaeus experienced life change that day because Jesus had come searching for him. Because God had come searching for him and he was so moved that his heart moved him to repentance to change his ways, to give half of what he had to the poor and to pay back four times of what he, what he had taken. Now, this is my example of saying, here's a man who gave all. Because if he gave half of what he owned to the poor and four times what he had taken, he probably didn't have anything left. Demonstrating his repentance towards God. And Jesus said, salvation has come to this house. And then Jesus made that statement. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save what was lost. That was his mission. Fulfilling the very heart and mission of God that began in the garden. Where are you? God seeks to save lost humanity. Earlier this year, I had the opportunity to go to Mozambique, Africa, and to spend some time with our missionaries there. Mozambique is a place of great darkness. 
many people that don't know Christ there. Most of them are Muslim, but they're also animistic, which means their lives are governed by, by the fear of evil spirits and spells and curses and the witch doctor and all of those things. One of our friends there, Brian Harrell, another missionary that you support through the cooperative program, ministers there among the Nahara people group. They live on the coast of Mozambique. They're a, a fishing people. And they take these gigantic nets. They're almost as big as this room. And they'll spread those nets out and they dive down and they'll take those nets and they'll pull up everything. Now, you can't fish that way here at Lake Havasu City. You'd get arrested for doing that. But that's how they fish there. Only before they go fishing, they go to the witch doctor, and the witch doctor gives them these little charms, these charms that they have placed a blessing or they have, uh, they have blessed in some way because it's supposed to ward off evil spirits and make it possible for them to catch fish. And then the witch doctor will sell them this potion, potion that he has conjured up, and he has cast all the evil spirits away from it. And if they pour this, this uh, potion on their nets and they have those charms, then the witch doctor says that they will catch fish. Of course... Well, those charms and that potion cost, so witch doctor can stay in business. Brian Harrell goes down to those beach areas, and he tells those fishermen stories from the Bible. And he prays with them, and he encourages them, and he'll tell those guys, don't, don't believe in what the witch doctor tells you. Don't, don't trust in these charms or these potions. Believe in God. Trust in Jesus. He'll take care of you. Brian told me that last spring he had to be gone for a couple of weeks. And when he got back, one of the fishermen came up to his house and he said, Missionary, come down. He said, we have not caught any fish since you left. And he said, it encourages us so much. Come down and, and tell us a story and pray with us. So he went down and he began to speak to the fishermen. And told them a story from the Bible and he prayed for them. And then he admonished them once again. Don't, don't trust in these charms. Don't believe what the witch doctor tells you. Believe in Jesus. Trust in God. He'll take care of you. The very next day, the fisherman comes running up to his house. Missionary, missionary, come quick. The fish have come. And so he goes down. And what he finds is they, they're trying to pull this net up onto the shore. And they've caught so many tuna that literally the, the net is full. And they have, the fishermen are in the water and they're, they're throwing tuna up onto the beach. Brian gets into the water. And he starts throwing tuna, just trying to help them. They've strung a secondary net around that first one. They're trying to catch the fish that are getting away. Finally, they get those fish up on the, on the beach. And there's a pile of tuna, probably 100 or 200 fish. And the leader of that team is so grateful comes up to Brian. He's got two tuna in his hand. And he gives them to him. He said, missionary, last night, when it was dark, no one could see me. I came down and cut those charms out of the net. And now we know you are telling us the truth. Amen? Would God do that? Well, I think there's a story in the Bible about that, isn't there? Something about nets and fish and having to get help and all of that. I'm pretty sure that's there. God's still in the business of seeking to save lost humanity. That's what he's about. That's what he's doing. And that's what he enjoins us and invites us to be a part of as well. I only have one more scripture I want to share with you. And it's just a few pages over in John chapter 20. Because Jesus accomplished the mission that God had for him. When he went to the cross and gave his life as a sacrifice for our sins. Shed his blood so that we might have forgiveness and a right relationship to be restored to God. Rose again on the third day. And on that, on that occasion, as Jesus is speaking to those disciples... He made this statement. John chapter 20, verse 21. Jesus said this. Peace be unto you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. 
Remember the voice of God in the garden? Where are you? Do you remember what Jesus said about why he came? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save what was lost. Now Jesus says, as the Father sent me, I am sending you. The mission of God has become our mission. As followers of Jesus Christ, now we continue the mission that he came to fulfill. The voice you heard on the video, David Platt, made this statement. Every believer this side of heaven owes the gospel to every lost person this side of hell. Every believer this side of heaven owes the gospel to every lost person this side of hell. What else can we give our lives to that is more important than this? We've been invited by God to be a part of making his salvation known among people that he loves. And we know that when we share this gospel, people are going to be saved from every tribe, every nation, and every people group. Because the Bible says that every tribe, every language, every nation will surround the throne and say, Worthy, worthy is the Lamb that was slain because of this mission. Some of you, although I'm meeting most of you for the very first time tonight, some of you know uh, our story. My wife, Diana, is back there in the back sitting with Merelda. Our son, Jeremiah Johnson, went as a missionary to Africa when he was 21 years old. It was really quite a surprise to most of his friends and even to some of us. As Jeremiah grew up as a pastor's kid and in some ways kind of resembled what you hear from people about pastor's kids. He was, his spiritual experience was kind of like this, up and down and in and out. When he was a sophomore in college, he came home one time and he said, uh, Mom and Dad, the kids at church are planning a mission trip to Africa. I think I want to go. I said, okay, son, that that sounds great. Maybe we should pray about that and talk about that. He says, no, Dad, I just want to go to Africa. (laughs) Okay, we'll go with that. Um, He put his application in, and we're still not really sure why the mission team accepted him on that team. Spiritually, he was not qualified. I think they needed guys, honestly. I I think they needed another guy to go. But we began to pray that God would do a great work in Jeremiah's life and that once and for all, that issue of who God is in his life would be settled. God began to do that work even before they left. They went on a team over to Mozambique, and while they were there, they taught about true love weights. You know, AIDS is such a huge problem in Africa 29 million people have died since the beginning of the AIDS uh, epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa alone. 49 million people live uh, HIV positive today in sub-Saharan Africa. And they taught about true love weights because we believe the best way to attack that problem is to teach people to abstain from sex until marriage and then to be faithful to one person in marriage. It will stem the tide of AIDS. They taught about that, and they also showed the Jesus film. And village after village after village, they would show this visual portrayal of the life of Christ to people who many have never seen a movie at all but had never seen a portrayal of the life of Christ. They saw hundreds of people come to know Christ. That trip changed his life. Jeremiah got off the plane. He wasn't, we weren't with him more than five minutes. He said, Mom and Dad, I'm going back to Africa. I like Pastor Chad. I've seen a lot of people over the years come back from mission trips, and and they're always excited. They're always enthusiastic, so I did what any good dad did. Um, Okay, son, we'll talk about that when we get home. Let's go get the luggage. A few nights later, we had a meeting where the kids were kind of debriefing. They were sharing about their experience and trading pictures and talking about stories. And when it came to Jeremiah's turn, he said, uh, well, he said, I want you guys to know I've made application with the International Mission Board for the hands-on program. I'm going back to Africa. And I looked at him like, what are you talking about? He was determined. He was going back. This is what Jeremiah told us. The last day of that mission trip, they went down to a beach area right there on the coast of the Indian Ocean. Miles and miles of really uninhabited beach area. American college students, one last day, they were down there at the beach playing games and going in the water and doing all the stuff that they do. Just off of that beach, there is a village. There were some children that were watching these American college students Kind of a curiosity. You know how kids are. They got closer and closer. 
Jeremiah had brought a soccer ball down to the beach that day, and he was kicking it around. And in Africa, a soccer ball is kind of like gold. I mean, they'll play soccer with anything, bundles of trash, plastic bottles, anything they can find, but a soccer ball. Well, it wasn't long before those children were kicking that ball around with those kids and kicking it back and forth with my son. And while that happened, God spoke to Jeremiah. I don't know what's more unusual, that God spoke to him or that Jeremiah listened. (laughs) But Here's what God said. Who will tell these children about me? Who will tell these children about me? Jeremiah never forgot that. So he put in his application. At the same time, the missionary that we work with there put in a request for an American college student to come and do what's called sports evangelism. Come and do that very thing. Come and play soccer with kids and share the gospel. And Jeremiah went, 21 years old. What Jeremiah didn't realize was those children that came down from that village were from a Monegan people group. The Monegan people group are an unreached people group. One of the over 6,000 unreached people groups in the world, over 1,600 unreached people groups in sub-Saharan Africa. Totally unreached with the gospel. Culturally Muslim, mostly animistic, just like the other people I told you about. Jeremiah went as the assignment to reach that people group. And he went to village after village after village and he dropped a soccer ball and with the help of a Mozambican pastor, they would share the gospel. One village that they went to, there were some Muslim men that were there and they didn't like what they saw. And so they said, why have you come to our village? And they said, we've come to share the word of God with you. So then we want you to leave. There were two other Muslim men that watched this happening and God spoke to them. And they came over and said, why have you come to our village? And they said, we've come to share the word of God with you. He said, then come to my home and share with me and my friend. And they went to that home that day and they shared the gospel. And those two men became believers in Jesus Christ that day. They went back the next week and there were four. They went back the next week, there were eight. They went back the next week and there were 11. And on that day, As they were going back into town, there was a terrible motorcycle accident. And Jeremiah was killed. 21 years old. He gave his life for the mission of God. But that's not the end of the story. Because that Mozambican pastor and other missionaries continued to go out to that village. To share the gospel and to teach those people what it meant to follow Jesus Christ. And by the time Diane and I arrived just a few months later... There were 17 people in that village ready to follow Christ in baptism. And we baptized them on that very beach where Jeremiah heard God speak to him. I've been back to that village five times. I'll go another time in March. And now there are nine different villages, nine congregations that have come out of that one incident, that one work, that the Monegan people now are embracing the gospel. They're coming to know Christ. And every time I go... They come to me and they'll say, Pastor, come with us. We found another place they haven't yet heard. Because they understand that God came into the garden saying, where are you? Jesus came to this planet to seek and to save that which is lost. And now he says to us, as the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Whether it's Peach Springs or Albania, or Thailand, or Mozambique. That's the mission of God. Are you a part of it? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your mission that made it possible for us to know you, to have forgiveness of sins and eternal life, but God, help us not to let the mission end with us but to do what you want us to do, to carry that mission to those that you're still seeking to save. For it's in your name we pray. Amen.